Welcome back to Policymakers. Uh, my name is Tom Cross, and we're talking about a subject uh, that many of you may know about, some of you may not. It's diabetes. Uh, we've been talking about type 1 and 2. And uh, our second segment, uh, we're having Dr. Lou Phillipson, who's with the University of Chicago, and he's a professor in the Departments of Medicine and Pediatrics at the University of Chicago, and also the director of the Kovler Center. We had Peggy Hazenauer on uh, in our first segment. Dr. Phillipson thank, you, Phillipson, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having us. Tell us a little bit. Uh, you are an endocrinologist. That's correct. What, tell people what an endocrinologist is. Well, what do you do? An endocrinologist is a doctor who deals with proteins that are called hormones. So hormones are made in a variety of places in the body. You have the thyroid gland, which is very important, master control organ, the adrenal glands near the kidneys, and the parts of the pancreas are also secreting hormones, in which case for diabetes, the most important one is insulin. So an endocrinologist deals with all of these things. I happen to focus my practice on diabetes particularly. And uh, the, the, the pancreas' inability to, to That's generally. right. That's right. And what we think about diabetes these days as either a, an absolute lack of making this thing called insulin or a partial lack. So people who are large who, uh, or who have uh, resistance to insulin, so their body can't respond to it, their pancreas then can't make enough insulin to compensate and the result is diabetes. At the University of Chicago, among all the other things that you do, you are not only treating folks with type 1 and type 2, and as Peggy explained the difference in the first segment, you're also working on, on research on trying to hopefully someday prevent or, or cure diabetes. Absolutely. I mean, that's really why we exist, is to do the research and also then to translate it both to individual patients and to the community. So part of our effort is that we have one of seven diabetes research and training centers that are funded by the National Institutes of Health and there's about 11 other similar uh, organizations that are funded by the NIH around the country but we're the only one in the Chicago area and we work with other of these diabetes centers in the Midwest in Michigan in, in uh, Nashville uh, and a few other places in St. Louis to really understand the basic research for both type 1 and type 2 and how to improve people's health using that knowledge. Is there a pretty good um, line of communication around the country and even for the, around the world of, of trying to making sure everybody's talking? How do you do that? Well, nothing is perfect, but we, ha we get together quite often. Yeah. So just last month, for example, I was in Vienna for a couple of days at the European Association for Diabetes meetings, which was uh, about 15,000 people from all over the world. The American Diabetes Association organizes its annual meeting in June every year. That's also close to 20,000 people from most of the United States but all over the world and even smaller meetings again just last week uh, there was a meeting of the directors of the various diabetes research centers that was outside of Washington DC so there's a lot of physical communication as well as journals that we read literature emails so that there's a very rapid um, dissemination of information right now and you're on the board of the American Diabetes Association. That's right so uh, last year I was nominated to be on the board of the American Diabetes Association which which has frequent meetings and part of the the, um, the the reason that American Diabetes Association exists is to both disseminate that information make sort of practice standards and ideals for doctors in the United States and all over the world and to disseminate that information so they have a wonderful website which is diabetes.org with a www in front of it but I'm also very involved with the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation I'm on some of their grant review panels we receive funding from both organizations for our research. So together, these are two very powerful and important groups for, for patients as well as physicians. Let's talk about some of your research because you've done some, done some things here in Chicago at the university. Um, the Lilly's Law, I want to talk a little, right. explain the Lilly's Law. It's a pretty fascinating development uh, in what's going on in diabetes research. Well, to, to put that in context yeah. and what Lilly's Law is all about and right. how excited we are about it and grateful to you actually for, for helping us uh, so, so amazingly well to get through. Uh, the idea is that most people think about diabetes as either type 2, which is the most common. There are about 25 million people in the United States with type 2. About 10% of that is type 1, and people think about that used to be juvenile, or right. the people who are on insulin, or they will die. And then a smaller percentage is other, so not type 1 and not exactly type 2. Many of them have what we call single gene diabetes. We call that monogenic diabetes. There are probably hundreds of thousands of people in the United States who have that, mostly not diagnosed. 
a very small proportion of those people have diabetes essentially at birth. And that's what Lilly's Law is all about. We don't think there are more than maybe 100 people that we've identified in the entire country. This really is research that came to benefit people only about four or five years ago. By identifying those people with this genetic cause of diabetes, which happens in the first few weeks or months of life, we can make an amazing transformation. So they, have, they, have, they must take insulin to live, but because we can identify them, we can do, sequence exactly which gene in their body is, uh, is wrong. Uh, we think about that as sort of pearls on a string, and one of those pearls is the wrong color. And each pearl can be maybe 26 different colors. So just one of them being wrong in this particular case is the cause of their diabetes. The miracle of science here is that giving them a simple pill, which is cheap, one of the cheapest, oldest drugs we have for diabetes, gets them off insulin. So it's so critical to identify these people that one of our patients, the, the Jaffe's, the Lily's, Lily's parents, and us thought that it would be great to have a law that in both uh, increased awareness of this unusual condition and made it a reportable illness. But this, and, and I don't want to, this young gal, if you're from the Chicago land area, it's been reported, you, you, I don't know if reversed is the word, but she's now on the, on the taking her med medication and she's not on insulin. That's right. She was on insulin from the first month of life, if you can imagine. So one of her parents was up every night with her from that point until we met her almost three and a half years ago. Since then, we were able to make that diagnosis and switch her to pills. And then she put her insulin basically in a drawer and it's been there ever since. Pretty remarkable. It's been astonishing. I have to say that I thought I would never see another case. But diabetes communication being what it is, we now have uh, over 100 cases of very early onset before, year, before the first year of life in our registry and a few others in Illinois and in surrounding states. And what's even more remarkable is that in some cases we've discovered the cause of their diabetes also as coming from a single gene. It's been very exciting. I, we're gonna, I want to talk about Lily's Law. Unfortunately, this segment went very fast. We're going to come right back and continue to talk about the exciting things going on at the University of Chicago with Dr. Philipson. Peggy has an hour. And uh, we'll be back for our third and final segment in just a moment.